Hey everyone, welcome to Spotlight on CRISPR. My name is Antonio Regalado. I am the biotech editor at Technology Review. We're here with two great guests, Jennifer Doudna and Adam Bolt for 30 minutes of conversation about CRISPR, the gene editing super tool. Now, Jennifer hardly needs an introduction. She's world famous as the biochemist who is happily laboring in ivory tower obscurity until 2012 when she co-developed uh, CRISPR uh, as an editing tool, which launched her sort of onto the center stage of great debates about how uh, we're going to use this power to change DNA. Uh, Adam Bolt is the director of a very fine documentary about CRISPR, uh, which features Jennifer and many other people who played a role in the technology's development. His movie uh, is playing on Nova. And before we start the conversation, we're going to see the trailer. So uh, let's roll the clip. Mother Nature gave us something that's richer than our imagination. We saw a very peculiar pattern. Never seen anything like this before. I remember him saying, remember this word, CRISPR. We've never had the ability to change the fundamental chemical nature of who we are, and now we do. And what do we do with that? Biggest doctor told me, just hold on, there's something coming. You can actually use CRISPR to change DNA. You can actually do it. We could engineer a single gene that could potentially make us all more muscular. But should we make that universally available? Что человек может создавать человека, человек, который может воевать без страха и без боли. И вот то, о чем я сейчас сказал, может быть страшнее ядерной бомбы. Should we really be manipulating the heredity of future generations given our lack of knowledge about so many things? I don't know where you draw the line between not having albinism and deciding your kid needs to be an extra foot taller so they can be a good oarsman and go to Yale. Where is that line? Who's going to draw that? Anything that will stop my child from suffering, I'm for. You know, draw this ethical line wherever you want, but don't draw it in front of my disease. What does that mean for this science, where we have the capacity to edit in some things that we think are important? Are we playing God? You don't realize it's disruptive until you look backward. Often you don't realize that you're in the middle of a revolution until after the revolution has occurred. That's great. Adam, such a wonderful uh, movie. And it's always interesting, uh, you know, for me as a journalist to encounter another one. Um, and I was impressed that you let people just sort of speak for themselves. It wasn't kind of a gotcha type of movie. Um, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what you set out to do in the film and, and, and you know, how, how you think it, uh, did, you, did you achieve what you wanted to? Yeah, well, uh, it's great to be here. Um, actually, the in part, the idea for the film started with uh, an interview that uh, one of our executive producers, Dan Rather, uh, and also Elliot Kirshner, uh, did with Jennifer, um, uh, kind of in the early days of CRISPR being on the public scene. And uh, one thing I remember from that, she I don't know if you remember this, Jennifer, but um, she talked about you know the, the work that was going on in her lab and some of these huge implications of CRISPR as far as future human beings and you know the implications of that and then you know interacting with people in her normal life uh going to like a pta meeting i remember uh jennifer i don't know do you want to jump in and uh tell that story right well uh yeah thank you antonio for having us here hosting us and yes i remember that moment very well adam it was uh it was a uh probably you know, right around the time when I and my collaborator, um, Emmanuel Charpentier, were doing early work on the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And it was becoming clear that this was a powerful technology, and yet almost nobody outside of our small scientific community had any awareness of it. And imagine the feeling of 
you know, feeling that you are sitting on something that has the potential to ultimately to change the world and to change everybody's lives in the future. And yet nobody is yet aware of it. Government's not aware of it. Regulators are not. And, uh, you know, what do you do? And I, I, you know, that that was for me a very kind of visceral moment early in the field where I had to pivot from being, a, as Antonio said, a you know, a ivory tower academician to thinking about the very broad implications of a transformative technology. Yeah, yeah and so I, well, I would just add that for, you know, um, for me as a, a filmmaker, it was, you know, the topic obviously is hugely interesting and important, but it was also kind of the human side of this story of scientists like Jennifer and other people we talked to in the film, really, uh, you know, making this enormous step in genetic engineering and and having to deal with the implications of that. Um, and just the, the chance to kind of talk to those people and follow that was really exciting. In the, in, I had a question from a, a friend of mine who wanted to know, Jennifer, I mean, you have become sort of, uh, in a way, the face of the technology and you've entered willingly these debates about uh, different uses of the technology that might be more controversial, like the CRISPR babies and so on. Um, do you have a kind of a role model or an inspiration uh, that you use to, to, to sort of guide you in taking on that role, which is sort of not the scientist typical role? Um, well, you know, you might be surprised at my answer, but when I was uh, probably 10 or 11 years old, I, I, um, I was given the autobiography of Malcolm X by my dad. And I read that book, you know, and I read about Malcolm X. And then later, much later, um, my child went to Malcolm X Elementary in, in Berkeley. And, uh, and I think that, you know, in many ways, the, the whole civil rights movement has really been very influential for me because I think many of the folks that uh, stood up at that time for what was right, and, you know, we're seeing that circling back right now, um, you know, had to, had to really step out of their comfort zone. And that's really what I think this whole field has required for me as well. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so it's, it's about right and wrong. I mean, what, what, let's hear what is right and what is wrong with CRISPR. I mean, I've always wanted to ask you the question straight up. I mean, the civil rights, I mean, what what is it that you are against and what, what are you for? Well, let's start with what I'm for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful technology. It's very powerful. Um, it's very exciting. It's opened the door to many things that in the you know recent past, I think none of us would have imagined to be possible. I mean, imagine being able to cure a genetic disease and, and to have that kind of precision. I mean, it's just extraordinary to, to think about the opportunities there. And we'll see that, you know, we'll talk about that with regard to the film. I think, um, but at the same time, it's a, you know, it's a tool that requires oversight. It requires responsible use. I think it's essential that the scientific community step forward and say, this is what's possible. This is what's still science fiction, frankly. And, uh, you know, here are some, some, you know, hard lines that should be drawn about where it can and, and can't be used. Adam, how did you draw those lines in your in your movie about what was sort of uh, overblown science fiction versus something that was concrete uh, reality? I mean, did you you know a lot of uh, films that get made about genetic engineering are quite uh, spectacular and like to revel in the in the in the most strange uh, aspects of it? I mean, how did you handle that? Well, we tried to focus on things that were really happening, um, and I mean actually some of the things that seemed like a little out there in science fiction at the beginning when we started did end up being reality by the end of of making the film like um you know we follow a, a teenager with sickle cell disease which was one of the first diseases on the more kind of straight positive side that that people are looking to potentially cure with CRISPR and uh, you know, that work was kind of just getting started when we were getting started. And by the time the film was finished, there were clinical trials that had extremely promising results and maybe a few people who seemed to have been cured. Um, on the more far outside, we followed a company called eGenesis, which is uh, basically 
re-engineering the, the genome of pigs to make their organs compatible for human transplant, which is an idea, this idea of uh, kind of cross-species organ transplantation has been around for, I mean, I think more than a hundred years, maybe hundreds of years, you know, kind of in theory. Um, that hasn't totally come to, to fruition yet, but they, they've made some incredible progress. I think they're in trials in primates now with organs from, from pigs being put into to primates. So, um, so we just tried to focus on stuff that seemed tangible and real and, and not, you know, not just kind of what if scenarios, although we, you know, we talk about those too. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting questions from the audience and most people really want to know what CRISPR is going to be used for in the near term, kind of what's the status or what's the update. So maybe Jennifer, you can fill us in. Uh, and for people who don't know, maybe you can also give us just the simplest uh, explanation of how, how the tool works and then bring us up to date on, on what your institute is, is, is working on in terms of treatments. Let's start with what it is. So it's a, it's a technology for changing the genome. What does that mean? Well, it's a, you know, it's actually based on a bacterial immune system of all things, you know, highly relevant in this era of, of uh, coronavirus. And it's a way that bacteria can find and destroy viruses. And they do it by programming proteins, literally programming them with little molecular scripts that allow them to find a viral DNA sequence and cut it. And, and so the, in the, you know, the foundational work in the field was really understanding how that works and, and recognizing that it could be harnessed as a genome editing tool because in human and plant cells and other kinds of animal uh, cells, the cuts that are made to the DNA actually trigger a targeted change to the sequence at that position. And so it can be used for genome engineering. So, um, you know, what's happening now is that there's, as, uh, as Adam said, there are multiple clinical trials underway. It's kind of extraordinary to think that, you know, we're sort of eight, eight-ish years into this technology and, and we're, we're, we've already seen the results of, you know, some of the early clinical trials, very promising, uh, exciting data that are coming out. And um, I think in the near term, I really see two major um, opportunities. One is curing genetic disease. And, you know, sickle cell disease is a great example of this, where, you know, this is a disease that's been known for a long time. We've understood the molecular basis for it, but until now we haven't had a way to, you know, certainly not, not a way to cure it, um, much less really treat it that effectively. And so having an opportunity now to make a correction to the DNA that would actually fundamentally change people's lives who are affected by this disease. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And then, you know, of course, there are many other examples like that. So I think that's coming down the line. And then um, there's also the uh, extraordinary opportunities in agriculture and abilities to manipulate uh, plant genomes. Um, you know, we're living through uh, you know, a very real uh, sense of the impacts of climate change right now here in California and uh, other parts of the U.S. certainly are experiencing this as well. So I think increasingly opportunities to um, engineer, you know, plants and, and maybe microbes to have uh, the ability to process more carbon, to, um, you know, resist drought. I mean, these are, these are really, really important near-term challenges that CRISPR could address. I, I'm glad you brought up the food. I mean, a lot of people, there's, there's a whole campaigns against genetically modified foods, right? I mean, people do not like the idea of meddling or tinkering with, with nature. And certainly that's a trope in my reporting. You know, it's, I only cover tinkerers. Um, so there's always there's always trouble uh, uh, just steps away. But, you know, th it is a technology for altering uh, DNA, um, which hasn't been available before. So, I mean, do you have a framework in which you think about, you know, the, the whether we should or shouldn't uh, change the DNA that that's the product of evolution? I mean, it's a big it's a big step. And clearly some people just oppose it. Yeah, no, it is. It is a big step. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's fundamentally the the, the storyline that runs through all of human nature. Uh, the the film, you know, is is really this idea that this is just an extraordinary uh, capability that human beings now have in our hands. And what do we do with it? And uh, you know, the most extreme case would be, well, let's not do anything with it. And I don't think that's uh, a realistic or b even desirable. So then the question is, well, what should we do with it? 
And so, I'm, you know, my, my opinion is that, uh, you know, we should use it uh, in, a, in a safe and responsible way. How do we achieve that? Well, it's hard, but, but I think uh, the best chance we have of that is to have a transparent, open, ongoing discussion, certainly in the scientific community, but pulling in as many other stakeholders as we can so that people can evaluate the technology for themselves and understand what it offers. And my, my thinking, and I think just what I've observed in my life is that, you know, when, ten, when technologies offer real life uh, advantages, like when they make life better for people, then uh, people are more receptive to, to those technologies. And I think that's what we aim to achieve with CRISPR is to explain that. Right. Okay. And let's get to the subject of sickle cell disease, which I think is the perfect example of that. But Adam, first, I want to ask you, you interviewed Jennifer and all these other people involved in CRISPR. Uh, after you're done with your, with your movie, we're like, did you did you feel that this technology was in good hands and wise hands? Did you sleep more soundly or less soundly after after making the film? I mean, you mentioned the human element. It's like it or not. It's just a bunch of people in charge of this. So, you know, what was your takeaway? Yeah, I was uh, surprised and impressed by how seriously the scientists were taking, including Jennifer, and maybe especially Jennifer, were taking these ethical issues and and how much they were, in a lot of cases, kind of out out in front of it and trying. Actually, they were the ones going to journalists and the public and saying, "Hey, this is happening. Pay attention." Um, of course, at the same time, there's always you know. I learned stuff that made me sleep a little better, and then I learned other things that made me not sleep as well. Um, you know, you you also see that there are people uh, who really want to move quickly with this, want to you know start doing things before they're ready, as as like the the CRISPR baby story in China is a great example of, um, and just learning things about history. I mean, I think you know uh, one of the tropes that comes up a lot with uh, genetic engineering is the kind of brave new world dystopian scenario. But in my mind, uh, the dystopian scenario in a lot of ways has already happened. And that was, you know, the eugenics era in the early 20th century, which started in the US and the UK and eventually, you know, made its way to Nazi Germany with the horrifying results. And, um, and I, I, I didn't know much about that history when I started. And so digging into that uh, was really eye-opening. We, we, we dug up a clip that we play in the film of uh, a, a Nazi propaganda film from the kind of the early uh, days of the Third Reich in the, the late 30s. And, you know, it, it, it's about essentially genetic counseling and it takes the form of almost an advertisement for you know health and uh you know making sure you have quote unquote good genes which is what eugenics actually means um to pass down to the next generation so i guess it's also you can also see in the past how things that had horrible consequences you know maybe looked kind of benign to people at the beginning um, so I think there was plenty to, to make me sleep better and lose sleep, I would say. So I ended up just as tied up as I was at the beginning, I would say. <laughs> uh, on the concrete, concrete applications, talking about sickle cell disease, I just looked it up. Uh, I think the cause of sickle cell disease, the molecular cause, the, a misshapen protein was discovered in late 1950s by Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner. So that's the first genetic, the, the first disease in which the the, the molecular cause was identified. Uh, now it's uh, 60, 70 years later, and we don't have uh, a cure for sickle cell, but then maybe we do if it's CRISPR. So Jennifer, tell us where we're at with CRISPR for sickle cell disease. As you point out, sickle cell disease is, uh, you know, been, the cause has been known for a long time, for decades. And it's, a, it's an example of a disease that results from a single mutation in the human genome. Imagine that, a single base pair alteration in one gene of the genome. And, um, and so with, with CRISPR, we now have an opportunity to correct that disease causing mutation either directly by just you know, changing it back to changing that base pair back to um, the kind of the, we would call the kind of the normal or wild type allele that's found in, in most people that don't have sickle cell disease. Um, but there's also an opportunity to use it to 
activate the expression of, of fetal hemoglobin, which is normally turned off when we're born, but which could be uh, a way to mitigate the effects of sickle cell disease. And in fact, with the first uh, person who apparently has been effectively cured of, of her uh, sickle cell disease, this is actually what was done is to, is, to, um, is to mitigate the effects of disease by activating this other gene. So, um, you know, the multiple opportunities uh, with CRISPR, and that's one of the things that makes the technology so interesting. And uh, it also means that, that uh, we just have to be very, very careful, of course, about the accuracy of the, of the technology. And, um, and, and I think also we really have to think about how it's going to be delivered into people. Right now, it's a technology that for sickle cell requires a bone marrow transplant. And you know, if there were a future way to deliver CRISPR that didn't require that, obviously that would be, that'd be amazing. Right. Um, sickle cell disease, it, what you're saying is that it was an opportunity because of the way CRISPR works in the first instance to basically knock out a gene. There's one, there's a genetic element that you can kind of destroy that turns on a second copy of this, this uh, hemoglobin gene. Um, so that's what drew people to sickle cell disease. But then there was this National Academy report, which we three of us talked about the other day. Uh, it just came out, and it was the, the report that they prepared after the, the, the revelation of the Chinese CRISPR babies in Hong Kong, now almost two years ago, November 2018. So a scientist there uh, uh, revealed that he had actually started to modify embryos with CRISPR to make them immune to HIV. Uh, and that caused this huge controversy. The the academies um, then went forth to, to 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 create a report, but surprisingly, it's not it's not a report about you know how to stop this. It's it's actually a report about how this should move forward. And the head of the report, you know, called it a kind of a staged rollout of genetically modified humans. And what was so interesting is that although they said, you know, it's not ready for most uses, the, the use that they kind of highlighted was sickle cell disease. Because in the US, um, one in 13 African Americans carry the sickle cell trait. Uh, that means about one in 350 or so have the disease. And then some of them will actually get married to somebody else with the disease. And, and in those rare cases, apparently just 80 of them in the country, they estimated, in those rare cases, that couple would not be able to have under any circumstances a child without this disease. You know, you couldn't choose embryos or do any kind of testing. So they propose that, that, that could be the starting point uh, for CRISPR. And I don't know, I mean, Adam, in your film, there's a guy, David Sanchez, who's a CRISPR, I mean, a sickle cell patient. Um, so I thought, I was really uh, kind of surprised and shocked that sickle cell would be elevated to this role as the first use of quote unquote germline or heritable CRISPR. Did you, what was your reaction to that? Um, well, I'll, uh, I have to admit, I haven't read the whole report. I know it's many I'll hundreds take. of pages, but, um, but I read your reporting on it. So I, I know that that's trustworthy. Um, I mean, I mean, one thing that I think, there's a couple of things that I think are important to, for people to know, and I don't know if this is worth going into for this audience, but, um, you know, there's obviously there's this huge distinction between changing the DNA of a person who already exists. And usually, you know, if you're like these clinical trials with sickle cell that have happened that have, have shown to maybe have some curative effect, they're done in a way that, that if that person goes and has a child, that genetic change doesn't get passed down to the child uh, versus changes that happen, so-called germline editing, where uh, the change would get passed down to future generations. And that's one of the big Kind of dividing lines where people uh, try to draw some ethical boundaries for this. So, um, you know, curing sickle cell in living people is an obvious application for the technology that people are moving forward with, and very few people have a problem with. Um, the idea of doing it in the germline for all time, for all future generations, and, you know, that's a much bigger thing and raises lots of questions about what the unintended consequences might be. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's important to point out that in the United States and in lots of countries, uh, as far as I know, we're operating kind of in a, a regulatory environment where 
people can't do this kind of research right now, it, research into modifying human embryos. So uh, what happened in China, which also did involve some American scientists, uh, was kind of a rogue action and broke to a lot of people's eyes, a lot of very basic kind of ethical obligations in terms of patient consent and things like that. But it's also just research that in the United States uh, you can't really do. Um, so I don't know. I think, um, you know, the, the report, as you pointed out, it, it, it points out that uh, there's maybe 80 people in the country in this very unique situation of, of actually CRISPR germline editing being the only way to ensure that their child doesn't have uh, uh, this disease. And, you know, that seems like a small number, but on the other hand, for those 80 people, that may be a very compelling application. I think, you know, uh, you'd have to ask them and they, they might be hard to find if there's only 80 of them. I think that's kind of a statistical guess because yeah, right, it's, it's, right. it's a rare situation, right? Right. Well, I would just build on your point. Like, I don't think uh, the research is not forbidden in the U.S. In fact, uh, you know, the scientific societies, I think Jennifer's joined calls that actually encourage research on embryos or cells to figure out how to do this. What is what is illegal right. in the U.S. would be actually to make the, the baby. Moving so, forward with a pregnancy. Yeah. Right. So that's what I find fascinating. On the one hand, it is already illegal in the U.S. for the time being. Uh, on the other hand, the National Academies is coming forth and saying, well, you know, this is how you might approach it and, and do it. And the reason sickle cell is interesting is, is, of course, there's only 80 couples. So people are really kind of having to work hard to find even a reason to do this. I mean, they're really working hard to find a reason. Um, but it's still, to me, it's a little bit troubling that sort of this whole slippery slope towards, you know, other modifications that you might make in the future, enhancements, you know, sort of starting with the most vulnerable group, the proposal of the scientific community, let's start with the most vulnerable group of people to make, you know, genetically modified children. So that, that was the way it struck me. But I, I want to turn it to Jennifer because I've always felt, Jennifer, that you take an extremely cautious view towards the germline application, the, the, the hereditary use of CRISPR. Um, but on the other hand, you're part of the scientific community, so you form a consensus with them. Have you had a kind of a struggle about between your, your personal feelings and the kind of positions that you take uh, on this question? And then, of course, please tell us what your position is. Thank you. Well, definitely, I've had a struggle, and uh, you know, let, first of all, let's let's be clear. I think you know, my at least my reading of the report that you're referring to is not that this report is encouraging human germline editing. I think it's 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 recognizing that this is a technology that is not going away. There's a lot of interest in the opportunity that it offers in the future, and one of those opportunities is human germline editing, and we just have to we have to be realistic about that. And so I think the report makes an attempt to, given that reality, ask, how do we manage it? And how do we make sure that, uh, you know, to the extent possible, that people are using it in a responsible fashion? Um, and, uh, you know, my, for myself, uh, what do I think? Well, I, I feel I feel very aligned with that vision. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a realist. And, uh, you know, and I, I think that, you know, the reality is that the temptation to tinker with the genome, the human genome, is uh, only going to grow over time, especially as we learn more and more about our own genes and you know what what kinds of um, you know what potential we have to to manipulate our health uh, with with making changes to the to the genome. And so, given that reality, I think we just have to you know we have to manage it. I, I feel honestly, I feel mostly encouraged actually by the fact that the international community really has stepped up. I don't think we're seeing people running away from this issue. In fact, I think we're seeing lots of interest in this issue. Um, the, uh, you know, the actual CRISPR baby announcement from China was actually made at the second international summit on human genome editing. And there's a third summit planned for, for next year in London. And so there's a, you know, an ongoing international community of people that are actively working on this. So, you know, again, um, there's no, no guarantees going forward, but I think this is the best hope we have of really engendering a, a whole community of people that work together to en encourage transparency. That's a big point of the, this report is, is figuring out how you, you know, get people to 
speak up and, and talk about what they're doing or what they're seeing happening in their in their communities. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I sound like I might be a critic of, of this approach, but, uh, you know, that's on Monday and on Tuesday, I'll, I'm happy to write about why it might be really good and great medicine to, you know, eradicate disease in this in this way. Like, that would be fantastic. Like, why not clean up the genome? It's not perfect. Um, well, also, I, think, I mean, one thing I would add is, you know, I think uh, in, with these questions of regulation and in slippery slopes, you know, ideally in, at least in a democracy, um, that stuff is going to follow what people actually want and what they want to do with this technology. Um, and that's another thing we try to ask in the film is, you know, okay, if you could change you know, other things, not just diseases, but, you know, people like to talk about enhancements to strength or intelligence, you know, things which aren't necessarily possible right now, but maybe they will be someday. And the question is, is that something people want to do? And, um, you know, we point to a couple examples briefly, you know, there's the example of cloning, which attracted a lot of doomsday scenarios and you know, the early part of the 21st century. And turns out, as Antonio, I remember you pointing out, you know, not a lot of people wanted to be cloned, it turned out, although people do yeah, want right. to clone their pets, which has <laughs> turned out to be the big market for cloning. Um, and and then on the more, uh, you know, enhancement front, uh, there's this great story about the Nobel sperm bank, which was a sort of specious effort to set up free sperm for you know women who wanted to to have a child that was supposedly going to be of higher intelligence, um, and you know uh, people kind of saw through that by and large. Not a lot of people took advantage of it. I think both because the actual science was pretty shoddy, and maybe people have other priorities when having children besides, you know, making them the smartest or the greatest athletes. Uh, there's a lot of more deeper emotional reasons that people have kids. So I think, you know, that that's kind of raises the question of, okay, maybe there's a slippery slope, but where will that, will that slippery slope lead to the chasm that we think it will, or will, right, right. will it lead somewhere else that we're not right. expecting, which could be good or bad, but uh, it may not lead to what we think. I want to I want to end up on that question. I mean, we're not none of us are kind of futurists, I think, but we could we could look far into the future and wonder what what will become of of us, the natural world, when we have this power. But we have a question from the audience that I I know that Jennifer has some thoughts on, which is, uh, what is the uh, you know is there some kind of combination here of artificial intelligence or machine learning software and CRISPR? I think your institute is engaged in making CRISPR sort of more accessible, easier to use, easier to deploy in the world, including on adult genomes. Um, and that is probably, to Adam's point, that's going to make it much more concrete. Like if it's if it can be if it can be used routinely, then that's when we're going to see these consequences. So maybe you could tell us, uh, Jennifer, just what your institute is doing in terms of making it sort of a commodity, what the role of artificial intelligence is, and then maybe I'll ask you to project into the distant future? Well, the Innovative Genomics Institute that you allude to is uh, was founded about six years ago between Berkeley and UCSF with the goal of advancing genome editing in particular with an eye towards responsible use and affordable and accessible um, use around the world. How do we achieve that? It sounds hard. And uh, so our, our vision is to bring together teams of people, whether they're from academia or companies or nonprofits who want to work together to make this happen. And in particular uh, with machine learning, I think that what I'm seeing right now is that, you know, there's lots of uh, talk and, and a few uh, partnerships that have gotten started that are, are with an eye towards using machine learning or artificial intelligence to analyze genome editing data that are coming out of these, you know, CRISPR type experiments, mostly in, you know, cultured uh, cells in the laboratory at the moment. But I, I see an opportunity in the future to use that as a way to predict genome editing outcomes, and in particular, to be able to um, ensure that genome editing is done accurately and with the kind of precision that will be important, especially for clinical uses without requiring extensive experimentation for every single 
application. And I, I really, I see that coming, you know, it's probably not going to happen uh, in a year, but I think, you know, within five years, we'll certainly be seeing, seeing this uh, more and more. And, um, and it's really kind of a, I think a great example of, of what many people have commented on, which is this integration increasingly of tech and biotech, right? Where there's, you know, uh, you know, opportunities to bring tech and technologies in particular in the computer uh, sciences area together with biological approaches and, and, and technologies like CRISPR that will really enable the whole field to move that much faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just for the viewers, I guess, when, when you have to make your little CRISPR reagent, you know, to treat the sickle cell patient, there, there's many places you could make the cut or many different ways. And so you have to kind of do it optimally. And you can either figure that out by doing thousands of experiments in the lab, which is certainly possible, or with machine learning. I would say, you know, one of the disadvantages of this uh, integration of tech and biotech is we have all the tech people coming to biotech who bring their own uh, philosophy, which is really one that's alien uh, to a lot of people in, in biology, including and uh, you know a kind of futuristic, even transhumanist view of the world. Um, we have a question from the audience: Can CRISPR be used to end aging or to increase life expectancy? I think it's a, re a relevant question. We're all on Zoom, like trying to survive. So if CRISPR could, you know, ex extend life, that that would be a seriously significant. Um, change uh, for humanity. So we got to wrap it up, but let's let's end on people's thoughts about the, the distant future. Pick your pick your year, uh, 2075, 2100. What is the biological world going to look like now that we can control it in this way? Adam, did you develop a view? Um, well, I'm going to dodge your question a little bit, but uh, I think, you know, I did really spend a lot of time thinking about the distant future and also the distant past uh, and you know how something like this might play out over hundreds or thousands of years. In and fact, your, my f well, your, I was film, say one of your film begins with a, uh, a kind of a narrative about uh, time. Uh, exactly. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and the fact that, you know, the history of genetics, I mean, there's, you know, the famous uh, Carl Sagan in Cosmos, you know, looking at the, the scale of the time in the universe from, you know, the origin of the universe and the formation of Earth and like human history is like a fingernail. And within right. that, you know, our understanding of genetics is microns of, of you know, nothingness, really. Um, but one of my favorite things we did in the film is we went to Turkey to this place called Çatalhöyük, which was one of the, the earliest known sites where, well, an early site, there are quite a few of them all over the world, but one of the early sites where agriculture seems to have been getting started, which, you know, some would argue is the earliest form of genetic ma manipulation on the part of humans. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason we went there is to ask the question or just uh, put people in the mindset of thinking about what those sort of early prehistorical quote unquote scientists were thinking. And, you know, th they certainly couldn't have imagined that those early steps were going to lead to industrial agriculture and, you know, a planet where a substantial percentage of all land is used for, for crops and livestock. And also, you know, in, uh, agriculture, of course, enabled tremendous population growth and is maybe one of the keys of human civilization, period, full stop. But certainly had some tremendous un un unanticipated consequences. So yeah. um, I think, you know, the, what, what I came away with is just, you know, we have to take this one step at a time. And I think it's good for people to ask these questions and be skeptical and be a little cautious and be in doubt. We don't have to answer all the questions right now. I think that maybe the scariest thing is just how quickly things are moving. So right. you know, let's well, slow it down a little bit and think about it. <laughs> Jennifer, with CRISPR, some of those first steps in the sand uh, are your footprints. So where do you think uh, it's going? I mean, again, 50, 100 years hence, like what, what is your, uh, what is, where does your imagination take you? Well, there's no doubt that uh, things will look different than they do today. <laughs> um, and and I, I have to agree with Adam. I mean, the, the pace at which things are changing is is truly extraordinary. You know, and, and it, so it's very it, predictions are, are very tough to make. That being said, I would I would imagine that certainly within 50 years and and 
you know, beyond that we're going to see extraordinary advances in agriculture with, with genome editing. And I, I do hope that by that point, we also have genome editing as what I would call a standard of care for certain kinds of diseases. I'm not talking about germline editing here. I'm just talking about, you know, being able to correct uh, spontaneous disease causing mutations and do that in a, in a standardized way that is affordable to, to people um, around the world. Terrific. Um, we have we have so many questions uh, from the audience, but I'm going to wrap it up. I'm trying to find my uh, wrap up comments, and I have too many windows open, so I can't find it. So I'm just going to improvise. Thank you so much for being here, Adam and Jennifer. Terrific movie. Uh, the audience can catch it, I think, on Nova, uh, PBS Nova, which is the kind of the co-sponsor of this event. Uh, check in here on Spotlight CRISPR, uh, I mean, Spotlight series from Technology Review. We have more conversations uh, in the near future, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, so thank you, everybody, from Zooming in, and we'll let you get back to uh, real life. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great to be yeah. here. Yep. Bye-bye.